We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that he has done for us, for his teaching, for his example, and of course, for the gift of salvation, which he purchased for us at such great cost to himself. Lord, we just pray that we would know your blessing upon our thoughts this morning, and Lord, that we would be listening for the voice of your Holy Spirit as he speaks to our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 5. Today we're going to be looking at one of the most familiar stories in all the Gospels, I'm sure. If ever there was a story in the Bible that people in Imouth might know, it's this one. It's about the story of a miraculous catch of fish. Now I think this story is miraculous for a couple of reasons. The first one being obvious, of course, the amazing catch of fish. But there's a second miracle, I think, found in this story as well, and it's through Peter, because you see here, we have a fisherman who spent all night fishing and was still willing in the morning to admit he caught nothing. Now, I don't mean to call into question the character of any fisherman I know. These are men who work seriously hard, and they quite literally risk their lives to put fish on our tables. But I have known a fisherman or two who could tell a tall tale, especially when it came to the size of their catch. Now, we've got a friend who is an expert metal worker. He specializes in fish and wild game. His work is amazingly lifelike. His metal sculptures have been featured in major publications and galleries all around the country. Now, one day, a few years ago, he was contacted by someone from a foreign embassy in London. Now, because this will be aired online, I'm not going to mention any names. But let's just say the embassy represented a rather large country to the east of Europe. And the president of the country had caught a pike one day while out fishing. And the diplomat from the embassy was inquiring whether our friend could make a metal sculpture of this catch for the president. I got to see the photograph. The president was standing there, bare-chested, holding the pike in his hands. Our friend was in a bit of a quandary. The embassy had informed him that it was a 40-pound pike. But our friend, who is also an experienced flying fisherman, told me that the pike in the photograph couldn't possibly be more than 30 pounds. <laughs> so he said, what do I do? Do I sculpt the actual fish in the picture? Or do I sculpt the fish the present claims he caught? Well, I don't know what ever happened, because I don't think he ever got the fish in any end, but, but here we have, in our story today, a story about fishermen out and a, and a catch of fish. It takes place at the outset of Jesus' ministry. Up till now, we've known actually very little about Jesus. Luke tells us the story of his birth, and of a visit that the boy Jesus made with his family to the temple in Jerusalem when he was just 12 years old. But beyond that, we really don't know much more about the first 30 years of his life. And then one day, Jesus shows up on the banks of the River Jordan, where John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing those who had repented of their sins. And Jesus comes up to him and he asks to be baptized. John complies. And he did so, he was privileged to see a heavenly vision confirming that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Shortly afterward, Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he spent the next 40 days and nights fasting. And it was while he was there in the wilderness that you remember Satan came and tempted him. As a man, Jesus would have been in a physically weakened state after having fasted for such a long time, and yet he overcame each temptation that the devil put in his way. And so the devil, we're told, went away and left him for a season. From there, Jesus returned home again to his hometown, Nazareth in Galilee. He went to the synagogue there on the Sabbath day, as we're told, was his regular habit. And he was asked to read the scriptures. And he read a portion of the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah, a passage that foretold the coming of Christ, the Messiah. And when Jesus was finished reading, he closed the scriptures, looked at those gathered there that day, and he announced, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. 
And we're told that everyone there bore witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? There were some there that day that took offense at what he'd said. They took hold of Jesus and they dragged him out of town to the edge of a precipice where they threatened to throw him to his death. But Jesus escaped out of the clutches. He walked unharmed right through the middle of the crowd and went his way. And he came to Capernaum, a town on the Sea of Galilee. From there he would go out and preach in the towns and villages of Galilee with a message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. Everywhere he went, Jesus was teaching. He taught with the words that he had to say, but he also taught with the things that he did. He often spoke in parables, stories that were drawn from everyday life, but which had spiritual applications. And likewise, with every miracle that he performed, there were spiritual lessons to be learned. In a sense, his miracles were just like parables acted out. And so this brings us to Luke chapter 5 and to our story for today. It takes place in the outset of his ministry, very early days of Jesus' public ministry. And it's a story of a miracle. But as you'll see, there are some important lessons here for each one of us about what it means to trust in God. Imagine the scene for a moment. We're told in uh, the Gospel of Luke, it came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. So he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And there he sat down and taught the people out of the boat there. Luke speaks here of the lake of Gennesaret, but it's just another name for the Sea of Galilee. It's about 13 miles long, about 8 miles wide. It's completely surrounded by a circle of low mountains. I wonder if Jesus had got up that morning to take a walk down by the lake shore. One of those rare moments when he managed to get some time alone by himself. These days, see, wherever he went, the crowds of people just came following him. So perhaps first thing in the morning, he caught a few moments of quiet. The sun had just risen above the hills, the light sparkling on the shimmering waters, the sun at the sky above, clear and blue, the distant hills still veiled in the early morning haze. The temperature would be rising, it was going to be another warm day. But all was still and quiet, save for the gentle lapping of the waves along the pebbled shore. A couple of fishermen nearby, mending their nets, after a long night of fishing. You could see they were tired, just wrapping things up before they would go home, maybe catch a bite to eat and maybe a couple hours of sleep. But then someone passing by caught sight of Jesus. And news quickly spread through the town that he was there. And before long the crowd began to gather. There'd be those that would come, as on any occasion, seeking healing either for themselves or for someone they knew, for a loved one in need. Others would come in hopes they might get a chance to see a miracle. But it seems that the great majority of them, according to Luke anyways, they'd come simply to hear him teach. Look at verse 1, it says, It came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. You see, Jesus taught them things they'd never heard before. He spoke in a way like no other. They couldn't get enough of him. The crowd continues to grow. It soon became a concern. With so many people pressing to hear him, safety become, became an issue. A large crowd of people could take on a life of its own. There was always the danger of someone falling or getting trampled on. Jesus must do something and do something quick to alleviate the pressure and avoid the possibility of someone getting hurt. So he called out to the fishermen nearby. He says uh, that if he asked if he could borrow uh, a boat from them, he saw two uh, ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out and were washing their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which is Simon's, and asked him if he could thrust out a little from the land. And from there he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Do you mind if I borrow your boat for a minute? 
Can you take me aboard and push off from shore all the way so everyone can see me and, and hear me and I can teach the people? So the fishermen agreed and Jesus climbed aboard and they shoved out onto the lake not far from the shore, just far enough so everyone could see him. I understand that the waters can act a bit like a sounding board so everyone would also be able to hear him without too much difficulty. The crowd settled down on the shore, a hush spread across as Jesus began to teach. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be there that day? What did Jesus talk about? But we know he spoke, spoke to them of the word of God. He talked about God like it was someone he knew personally. We can be sure he urged them to respond to the truth in faith, to repent of their sins and to seek after God with a whole heart. But now Jesus is finished for the moment. We're not told how long it took him to teach the people that day, an hour or so, maybe more, maybe less, we just don't know. But throughout the whole time, he was teaching in a borrowed boat. The boat was not his. It belonged to Simon. It's likely Simon, or Peter as we know him today, had work to do. Simon was a fisherman. Even if he wasn't fishing, there were always things that needed to be done. I mean, after all, he was many his next early that morning when Jesus first asked if he could use the boat. In other words, Peter had voluntarily given up some valuable time so that Jesus could teach the people from his boat time that he could have used to get some of his own work done. Now, of course, Peter would not have been a rich man. Fishing was his livelihood. Like most fishermen throughout most of history, he would have lived hand to mouth. In a sense, if he didn't catch fish to sell that day in the market, he wouldn't have the wherewithal to put food on the table that night. At this point, someone else might have just thanked Peter for the generous use of his boat, moved on, somewhat insensitive to Peter's needs, to the personal sacrifice that he'd made that day. But not so the Lord. Jesus taught us the principle that the laborer is worthy of his hire. In other words, that those who work deserve to be paid for it. The Apostle Paul repeated the exact same principle again later in the New Testament in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. Think about this one statement for just a moment, that those who work deserve to be paid. There are those today who claim the Bible does not speak out against slavery. Well, first of all, let me state emphatically that the main message of the Bible is not social revolution. The main message of the Bible is the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. One of the major purposes of the Bible is not to reform society, but to reform the hearts of the individual. To see men and women and boys and girls forsake sin and give their lives to Jesus, to live for Him and for His glory. So what about this issue then? What is the Bible's position on slavery? Well, as I read, as I said, that the Bible's primary emphasis is not about reforming society. It's a sad truth that throughout most of our history, man has enslaved man. The laws regarding slavery that you find in the Old Testament were not there to promote slavery, but rather to protect the slaves from unfair treatment, from cruelty and brutality. But if you take the message of the gospel and you take it all the way to its logical end, slavery cannot survive. The gospel transforms the way in which we relate to one another. As Christians, it no longer matters who is highborn or low, but rather through Christ we are all brothers and sisters together in the family of God. That changes everything about the way we would treat others. Take the teachings of Jesus, put them into practice, and slavery cannot long survive. But you don't have to take my word for it. All you have to do is to look at the record of history. Anywhere in the world where the Christian gospel has taken hold, it's not long before that incompatibility between the Christian faith and the institution of slavery becomes apparent. It's not long before they come into conflict with each other. And those countries in the world 
most thoroughly influenced by the Christian gospel are those countries today where people still enjoy the most freedom. But anyways, back to our story. Jesus had asked these fishermen if he could borrow their boat and their time that morning so that he could teach the people. But Jesus does not presume upon their goodwill or their generosity. He doesn't take their service for granted. He understands, after all, he's the one who affirmed the principle that a workman is worthy of his hire, deserves to be paid. If someone does something for you, then it's only right and fair that you do something for them in return. So Jesus tells Simon Peter in verse 4, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Right away we're impressed <clears throat> with the authority that Jesus has at giving this command. His statement is bold and is assertive. He's telling these fishermen what they need to do. Now, if these men were complete strangers to Jesus, his command might almost seem abrupt, a bit pushy. But you see, this isn't the first time that Jesus has met these fishermen. These men had met before. We know this from John chapter 1. You see, Simon Peter had earlier followed the ministry of John the Baptist. He was a man who had a sensitivity to spiritual things, to the things of God. And Andrew, Simon's brother, had actually been there on the day that Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized by him. And when John pointed out Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, Andrew was one of the two who went and followed after him. The first thing that Andrew did on coming to Jesus was to go and find his brother Simon. And what did Andrew say to him? Come, we have found the Messiah. And Andrew brought his brother to Jesus. It was on this occasion that Jesus gave Simon the name Peter. So you see, these men had already met before. And now here they are again, in a boat together, on the Sea of Galilee. A chance meeting? What do you think? Anyways, notice Peter's response to Jesus' instruction. Verse 5. <clears throat> Simon answering says to him, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at that word I will let down to the net. Peter here calls Jesus Master. Now, we're used to seeing the disciples call Jesus Master. And in every instance, it means teacher. In every instance, except for this one. Because you see here, Peter uses a different word. Here doesn't, he, he doesn't use the word for teacher. He uses the word meaning chief or commander. A little like the way in which you might use the word captain today. Now that word carries with it a very different kind of authority from that of a teacher. If you're an enlisted soldier in the military and a captain tells you to do something, you don't ask him why. Not unless you want to drop to the floor and do a hundred push-ups or go out and run a mile. It's a proverbial, if your captain asks you to jump, your response is to say, how high, right? Years ago, I was in grad school in Norfolk, Virginia. Among other things, Norfolk is known for having the world's largest naval base. I could walk down to the end of my street and look out across Chesapeake Bay and watch the aircraft carriers and the nuclear subs coming and going. In fact, to get to my classes at the university, I actually had to drive right through the middle of the base. It was really kind of cool. My flat was just a couple of blocks away from gate five. It was near the part of the base where they tested the jet engines. Quite regularly, they would be roaring in the background while I was trying to study or to go to sleep at night. Anyways, several times while I was there, I got a phone call. Same phone call. It was a commanding officer in the Navy, and he was wondering why I was not at my post. And each time I would tell him, well, he had the wrong person, that I was not in the Navy. I was a student at the university. And then he would ask me if my name was Stephen Bender. 
And I'm going to reply, yes, that's my name, but I'm not the Stephen Bender you want. Eventually he would hang up, although I was never really quite sure if he took my story or not. I often wonder what happened to the other Stephen Bender <laughs> when his commanding officer finally got a hold of him. But back to our story, I think Peter's instinctive word choice is interesting. In essence, Peter's saying, I, I can. I don't think it was said tongue-in-cheek. I believe it was said with respect. Something about Jesus that commanded respect from these fishermen. Think about it, if nothing else, they've been sitting in the boat that whole morning while Jesus had been teaching the people. What must Simon Peter have heard that day? What had he discerned in listening to Jesus? Certainly enough to recognize a measure of respect and authority for the man. Enough that when Jesus told him what to do, he felt obliged to do it. And notice the nature of Christ's command. It says at the end of verse 4, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. It was a specific command. He told Simon Peter to launch out into the deep. Now I'm not a fisherman. I'm not a very patient man. And I can't stand around for hours in hopes that I might catch something. So, and if I do, I want to eat it. I'm not ready to throw it back into the river because it's not the right size. So, anyways, having said that, I have gone fishing a few times. Enough to know that fish aren't usually found in plentiful numbers in the deep, at least if you're lake fishing. I've been out in the lake a few times with my brother-in-law especially. And we've never stopped to fish in the middle of the lake at the deepest part. We always end up at a spot near the shore, but it's a bit shallower, where the fish like to hide amongst the reeds and so forth. At least that was my experience. I'm sure there are some kinds of fish that you can catch out in deeper waters, but I think even in the North Sea, it's the shallower waters of the Dogger Bank, I think, where you're more likely to find a good catch of fish, if I, if I understand it right. Anyways, Jesus tells Simon Peter to launch out into the deep. Now, Peter does something here, which we all do from time to time. He calls Jesus master. So far, so good. He acknowledges Jesus is a man with the authority to command. But then he turns around and questions the wisdom of the Lord's command. He says, we've toiled all night, and yet we've taken nothing. As if to say, are you sure? Are you sure you want us to launch out into the deep? The fish just aren't biting right now. I don't see how launching out into the deep is going to make a difference. And of course, there were other alternatives to venturing out into the deep. For one, they could have stayed closer to the shore. It was less risky. It would have been a safer alternative. Maybe Jesus was right. Maybe there were more fish out in the deep, but they might have stood a, a, a better chance of catching something closer to shore. Or... They could have ventured a little farther out into the deep, like Jesus asked them, maybe not go all the way, and stay roped to the shore. Nice long rope. So that if they got in trouble, they could always hurry back. If the going got rough, they could be sure to get back safely. And you know, we could be like that. The Lord comes to us and He asks us to launch out into the deep. But we opt for a safer option. Stay closer to the shore. We're willing to serve the Lord just so long as it's safe and comfortable and predictable. We're content with smaller re results and little blessings, just so long as we're not asked to do anything that appears to be too risky or uncertain. Or maybe we might even be willing to venture a little farther out, but we keep ourselves tied to the shore just in case. So we can hurry back if things don't turn out the way we expect. We're willing to obey just so long as we don't face an obstacle, or a trial, or a difficulty. But if Jesus asks us to launch out into the deep, he'll have a reason for it. Perhaps there is something that we need to let go of. Something that's holding us back. Something that's keeping us tied to the shore. We need to stop doubting his goodness and his ability to deliver, and to learn to trust Him more. He wants us to go out into the deep because that's where the real blessing lies. 
the blessing that He really has in store for us. I remember when the Lord first began to deal with me about entering into ministry and about coming back to IMAP. I still had a student debt that needed to be paid off. I had a young family. How was I going to be able to provide for them? And then go back to IMAP? Are you kidding? What was there for me and my family that I didn't already have right where I was? But I had to be willing to launch out into the deep. And when I finally did, you know what I discovered? The Lord knew exactly what He was doing. He's provided for me and my family each step of the way. We've not had anything to worry about as far as that goes. And the sacrifices that we had to make turned out not to be sacrifices at all. I must have been a great place to bring up our family. If we had a choice to go back and do things differently, I don't think Marcy or I would want to be anywhere else. Now, David Livingston, he was a man who made some personal sacrifices. He was both a missionary and an explorer. He went out to Africa under the auspices of the London Missionary Society. He spent many years searching for the source of the River Nile. And in the process, he mapped out much of the territory of Eastern Africa, previously unknown to the outside world. He also called attention to the horrific brutality of the slave trade in that part of Africa. His travels brought a heavy toll on him, his family, his personal well-being. He kept a journal, a diary of sorts, of his experiences and observations and of his spiritual journey. I read the final volume. At one point he reflected on some of what he faced in Africa, and this is what he wrote. God, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. And sever any tie in my heart, except the tie that binds me to yours. Well, Jesus asked Simon Peter to launch out into the deep. He didn't specifically <coughs> promise Simon anything. He didn't actually tell him what he finally got there. He didn't even say anything about a catch or how big it might be. He just told Peter to go out and launch into the deep and let down your nets. Why did the Lord ask this of Peter? Well, he wanted to reward him for one thing. In a sense, it was his payment for the use of Simon's boat that day. Jesus never asks anything of us, but there isn't also the promise of blessing or reward that goes along with it. In the next chapter, in uh, verse 38, Jesus says, Give, and it shall be given unto you, with good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and run, uh, run over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you give out, it shall be measured to you again. That image of pressed down and shaken together. Have you ever got a cereal box and opened it up and it's half empty? I'm sure it was full when they filled it, in the, but it's been shaken together and it's settled down. There's not so much there. But what this is saying is that when God gives, He'll shake it together, press it down, and it will still be flowing out of the fold. It doesn't give stingily. Anyways, we shouldn't serve the Lord only with an eye to the reward. But nonetheless, the truth is, that's how God does things. We might not get a reward in this life, but there will be reward. That much is certain. In this way, how different Jesus is from many of the tyrants that we find in this world who demand so much and then give so little in return, if anything at all. Or what they give in return is just more exploitation and oppression. But the Lord, when He commissions us, always gives the promise of blessing in return for anything that we do for Him. Go ye and make disciples from all nations, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, he says, I am with you, even to the end of the world. Well, as it was, Jesus gave Simon Peter a command. And Peter's just not sure. After all, they worked all night and caught nothing. They were tired. Frustrated, worn out. Peter replies in so many words that 
Jesus just doesn't know what he's talking about. I wonder, have we ever felt the same way about one of God's commands? We understand what's being asked of us, but we can't possibly see how it's going to work. All we see ahead is further disappointment, or failure, or frustration. And notice something else in the text. It's a fine point which the newer versions actually miss. But I uh, notice in verse 4, in the authorized version, Jesus asked Peter to let down his nets in the plural. When Peter finally agrees to do what the Lord asks of him, he only lets down a net, singular, in verse 5. It's as though Peter was still not thoroughly convinced about the wisdom behind the Lord's instruction. He was willing to do what he did out of respect for the Lord. But in his heart, he wasn't really convinced there would be anything in it. His reluctance to obey stemmed from a lack of faith on his part in the Lord. He really didn't think that Jesus could deliver. So Peter obeys, grudgingly though it was. He didn't expect to receive much of anything. But out of respect for Jesus, he did it anyways. Now think about it. How often do we respond to the Lord in just the same way? Like the disciples who toiled all night were just too tired. We've done it all before and it's never gone anywhere. It's amounted to nothing. So why should we try again? Or maybe, like the disciples who were busy mending their nets when Jesus came to them, we're just too busy. We've just got too much on right now to worry about what the Lord wants from us as well. We're not intentionally dissing the Lord. We express a desire to get around to it someday, just not right now, maybe later. Well, look at what happens when Peter agrees to do what the Lord asked him to do. Verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they begged to their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink from the weight of the catch. Jesus delivered. They had a huge catch of fish, more than even two boats could hold. Here's the question. What if Peter had obeyed the Lord completely? Instead of just letting one down, down one net, he let down all his nets. Perhaps then the one net wouldn't have broken, been damaged. Perhaps some fish would have gotten away it did. They might have caught even more. But Peter is rewarded here with far more than he could ever have expected. I think Peter's learned something too in this process. He's got a greater understanding now, both of himself and of the Lord. Look at his response in verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draft of the fishes which they'd taken. This time he doesn't call Jesus captain, but Lord. Peter had been confronted with his own shortcomings. Among other things, the sin of doubt. He doubted that the Lord could deliver. And yet Jesus had blessed him so abundantly. Anyways, he hardly deserved such a reward. And of course, he's also been confronted with the amazing power of God. Throughout the Bible, whenever we see someone getting a vision of the Lord and his majesty and power, they always have the same response. When Job was confronted with the greatness of the Lord Creator. He said, I've heard of you before by the hearing of the year, but now my eyes behold you. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job says, now I see you as you really are, and I see myself as I really am, and I realize just how foolish and sinful a person or remember when Isaiah was granted the vision of the Lord, seated on his throne, high and lifted up. What was Isaiah's response? He cried out, Woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And yet, mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And now here, having witnessed the power of God, Peter is filled with fear in the presence of the Lord. 
and with a sense of his own unworthiness. And so he says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Do you see the irony in these words? Even while Peter is acknowledging Jesus is Lord, he's still telling him what to do. Depart from me, from a sinful man. How often we're just like Peter. We're confronted with the reality of Jesus and with a sense of ourselves as we really are and, 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 we, and yet we avoid him. We put him off. We tell him to go away. Leave us alone. When in fact, he is exactly what we most need. Notice what Jesus says next. Verse, as it says at the end of verse 10, he says, fear not. Don't be afraid. From henceforth you will catch men. And when they brought their ships to land, these disciples, these fishermen, they forsook all and followed him. Peter has finally got into the place where he needed to get to before he could take the next step in his spiritual journey. He's finally seeing himself in his human weakness and acknowledging the Lord and his holiness and power that Jesus is what he needs. Peter's now ready to follow Jesus as one of his disciples. What can we learn from Peter's experience? Well, one thing. Partial obedience is really just plain old disobedience. The Lord requires all or nothing from us. And indeed, the Lord deserves our all. Sometime later, Peter is again out fishing on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus comes to him and tells him to let down his net on the right side of the boat. The circumstances on that occasion were quite similar to the ones on this occasion. The disciples had toiled all night and they caught nothing. And the Lord's command was similar. Only this time Jesus spoke only of one night. But Peter's response could not have been more different. He recognized the voice of the Lord instantly. There was no doubt or hesitation on his part. He didn't want to tell the Lord to depart from him, but just the opposite. He rushed to the Savior's side, jumped over the board and swam to shore with no thought for himself. Filled only with a desire to be near the one he loved. Here's the question I leave with you this morning. Which Peter are you? Do you see more of yourself than Peter in the first instance? Small in faith? Strong in doubt? Reluctant to obey? Filled with excuses? Or... Is that that desire within you to be more like Peter on the second occasion? Strong in faith, instant in obedience, recognizing your own sufficiency and your need for the Savior, filled with a desire to know Him and to be in His presence. Obedience always involves an element of the unknown, a seeming risk, a test of faith. But only when we obey the Lord do we realize the full extent of His blessing and reward. Our responsibility is to launch out of the deep when the Lord commands and to let down the nets. He will take care of the rest. I trust there's something there that God can use to challenge you this morning. If you have a question concerning any anything sense raised, I'll be happy to speak with you further. The service is over. Let's. Will it have to come at the time?